time. And first of all, um, thank you for all um, to attend this uh, paper session. I know um, this is a global, truly global conference, and we have speakers from around the globe and also possibly audience from around the globe as well. And uh, welcome. And this is the first session after the keynote. I hope you enjoyed the keynote earlier uh, this morning in New York time, but you know, perhaps somewhere in the earlier in the evening um, or in the afternoon, if it's in Europe. Um, in any case, uh, today our paper session has uh, three uh, presentations and uh, our first uh, paper presenter is uh, Brian Dabrowski and who is an assistant uh, professor in the School of Information Studies in University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And his research focuses on, um, on social implications of metadata, uh, classification, resource um, description, and other knowledge uh, organization practices as well as concepts um, of personhood and the personal identity in information. Um, and Brian is uh, a graduate of the Syracuse University I School uh, PhD program and about three years ago or four years ago. Four years ago. Wow. Right now, wow. Yeah. Okay, without uh, further um, do I will uh, let Brian take over. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let's just make sure that this works. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Okay. So uh, again, thank you for that introduction, Jen. Uh, I'm Brian Dabreski from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and today I'll be presenting uh, on behalf of my co-authors, Melissa Resnick at University of Buffalo and Benjamin Horn at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, our paper here is Automated Parsing of Personal Identity Facets for a Collection of Visual Images. And, there we go. So over the uh, past 30 years, advances in digitization and in online systems and in metadata standards have opened up access to uh, all kinds of unique resources from collections of cultural heritage institutions. Uh, this is great, but the growth also presents some challenges as well. And discovering and navigating and understanding these historical resources can be overwhelming for users at times. Um, additional metadata, particularly subject uh, representation metadata, can assist here, but many digitized collections were originally created with very minimal subject representation, and retroactively enhancing metadata, as we know, is often a very uh, time-consuming process and sometimes uh, completely impractical. Um, so among collections of historical materials that have been digitized, uh, visual images are of particular interest to a lot of researchers and students and members of the general public. And a commonly held type of visual resource in these kinds of collections is uh, known as a carte de visite. Uh, they are early black and white images of usually individuals or uh, groups of people. Uh, they were meant to be given as uh, gifts or souvenirs so, and sometimes used as uh, means of advertising for things as well. So subject representation here uh, is uh, describing about describing the person depicted on the image usually and this practice has faced a lot of criticism in the literature for um, relatively thin and reductivist approaches to representing persons, often just a single term from Library of Congress subject headings. So in response to this um, uh, work that was started at the Syracuse University uh, Metadata Lab in cooperation with the university's archives and special collections, um, uh, eventually uh, uh, from that collaboration uh, was developed a faceted framework uh, capable of providing access to images of persons through a set of seven facets of personal identity um, listed here, age, gender, race, nationality, uh, condition, uh, relation, and role. 
so uh, previous work uh, here has shown the promise that faceted subject representation has for uh, collections of images of persons, uh, but it still runs into the same problem we were talking about earlier, and that is retroactively enhancing metadata is a very time consuming uh, prospect and is very costly. So in the present study, we took the previously established manual process of, of faceting identity uh, uh, characteristics about these persons depicted in images, and we attempted to automate it. So simply, can we take the process developed from the Syracuse University collection, automate it, and then use it on another collection of similar materials? So how feasible is this? How successful uh, would the results be? And how generalizable might the whole thing be to other kinds of collections? So those are the questions that we sought to answer with this study here. So to test the procedure, to take what had been done, automate it, and try on something new, we needed a new collection that had not been similarly analyzed yet. And there are actually a number of digital carte de visite collections available out there. Uh, but we decided on the A.S. Williams III carte de visite collection at the University of Alabama due to its accessibility and its similarity in scope. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this collection is, um, it's over 3,000 digitized images of carte de visite, and the majority of these are portraits of single persons. Um, the images themselves date from 1854 to about 1910. Now, it should be noted that the A.S. Williams collection uh, contains images of private citizens uh, as opposed to performers. So these were intended for personal use, uh, for mementos and gifts, uh, and not to be used as uh, advertisements. So the faceted process uh, used in this study, uh, as I mentioned, was originally developed uh, on collections at Syracuse University, particularly the Becker Eisenman collection, uh, which is a collection of carte de visite of sideshow performers uh, that were originally intended to uh, advertise. Uh, so there is some similarity in scope between the collections, but some dissimilarity as well. Now, the original facet parsing process was manual, and it relied only on image titles as opposed to actually viewing each individual image. And uh, it resulted in a set of facet dictionaries, which listed various keywords in a title that signaled the presence of some identity characteristic of the person being depicted. So to automate this, we reviewed uh, several different approaches, uh, including named entity recognition and a more heuristic rule-based method. Now, due to the very small amount of text that was present for each image title, uh, NER just is not practical uh, in this case. And so we elected to go with a rule-based method. Uh, so here, uh, Python was used to build a parser and a rule-based function uh, to take and automate the procedure. So the first step was testing to see if the automated process could duplicate the original analysis of the Becker Eisenman collection. And so we tested against previous results from that collection and compared to the manual process, uh, it was 97% accurate on detecting the presence of a person in an image based on title text. And it was 72% accurate in parsing facets, which meant um, signaling that one or more facet value was present for each person based on keywords in the title. So the next step was then testing it on the Williams collection, which required some modification to the cases, as I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, the Williams collection had 3,343 images, but many of them actually bore the same title. Uh, so there were only 767 unique title strings across the collection. Uh, and so we took those and we ran both the manual process and the new automated process against these titles and then compared the results. Uh, what would manual coding look like compared to the automated process on this collection that we hadn't seen before? Uh, so first I'm going to show quickly how the cases were modified and then I will get into the results of the test. So again, uh, we started by taking the manual process that was previously uh, developed in analyzing the Becker Eisenman collection and developed a case based model using title text to predict uh, both number of persons present and the identity characteristics that we could facet out. Uh, 
So from the Becker collection, there were six main cases that emerged and accounted for almost all the title text in the Becker collection. Uh, as you can see, these cases are largely based on the position and number of dashes, the word and, and commas. And so it's very syntactically uh, based case structure here. The, uh, in contrast, when we adjusted the cases for the syntax of the Williams collection titles, uh, five simpler cases emerged. So it was actually a simpler uh, set of cases here. Uh, these cases reflect the simpler uh, syntax that is used. Uh, there are no dashes. There are far fewer commas. Uh, in general, fewer distinct persons are depicted. Again, many of the images in the Williams collection are single persons as opposed to uh, two or three or even more people. The titles were also simpler and more formulaic, which is somewhat expected for private images, as opposed to the more um, performative advertising images of the Becker collection. So to give you an example of what these materials are like, as well as the parsing process, I'm gonna walk you through an example here. Uh, so we have a carte de visite here of Lieutenant J.W. Parrish. And in quotes, we see that text, Lieutenant J.W. Parrish, that is the title of the image, uh, and that's quite common. It's um, uh, Williams case one uh, from the previous slide. It's just a single person's name and descriptor. So I'm showing you the image here uh, just for clarification, but keep in mind that images were not visually inspected at all during the process. So this is entirely based on title. So this image conforms to Williams case one, where one person uh, is detected. Of the four terms present in the title, Lieutenant J. W. Parrish, only one is actually informative to us. Uh, that word is lieutenant. It's present in the facet dictionary. Uh, but fortunately, this word provides evidence of three facet values. Uh, we can infer the gender of male. We can infer an age of adult. And we know that the role of this person is lieutenant. So let's take a look at the results of the Williams collection analysis, uh, comparing the manual process to the automated process. Uh, first up is determining if a person is present based on title text. The manual process here was conducted by one researcher, and then the results were checked by a second researcher. Uh, the manual process found that 639 out of the 767 distinct titles uh, signify that at least one person is present. Other kinds of images were places or animals or indeterminate groups. The automated process found 666 titles signifying the presence of at least one person. This included all 639 titles that the manual process identified, plus an additional 27 titles. Uh, these 27 titles were checked and we did go and visually inspect the images at this point to see what was going on. And all 27 of these uh, examples were found to be incorrect. There was not a person identifiable and present in the image. Uh, even so, uh, this represents 95% accuracy in detecting persons compared to the manual analysis. Um, so uh, some important caveats about the process here. Even if a person seemed to be present, if nothing could be faceted out about them, it was considered to not pass the person detection test. Uh, uh, similarly, for indeterminate groups uh, like uh, Meyer family on holiday, uh, uh, wouldn't pass the person detection stage uh, either because no individual identifiable person is present. Uh, it's an indeterminate group of people in that case. So of the 27 titles incorrectly identified by the automated process, most of these were initialisms. Uh, as the first one there, you can see portrait of E.B. Lee. Uh, we know that this is clearly a person being depicted, but again, there's not enough here to pass the person detection task because there's nothing we can say about them. Based on that string of text, I don't know the age, I don't know the gender, I don't know anything about this person. Um, another error that came up, uh, rarely it happened twice, but it was interesting, was uh, surnames which held other name, other meanings in the Becker collection. So portrait of H.C. King here. King uh, uh, was used as a stage name in the Becker collection for uh, certain performers. Here the word is actually just a person's surname, and it can't be used to imply anything about uh, gender or age of the person. So the facet 
parsing process was next. And this looked at the words in the title associated with each person and compared them to the previously established facet dictionaries and then returned the number of determinable identity facets for each person. The manual process found 949 facets across the 639 titles. So some of them have more than one. For example, we saw Lieutenant J.W. Parrish had three determinable facets based on uh, the title of the image. Here, the automated process found more, uh, 978 facets. Um, of the 639 titles, the automated process exactly matched parsing for the manual process on 544 of them, so that was 85% accuracy. Uh, you can see here that gender and age were the most frequently parsed identity facets in this collection. And we also see that race, nationality, and condition did not occur at all in the collection. As far as the nature of errors committed by the automated process here, there were quite a few different scenarios going on. Uh, most frequently, though, was with the relation facet, where um, two persons in an image were assumed by the automated process to be um, married to each other or to be parent-child. Uh, so, for example, this uh, title here, Portrait of Mrs. Tibby and an Unidentified Man. Uh, we do not know without further inspection, and even with further inspection, we might not know if that is uh, her husband pictured with her or somebody else. So there's not enough to establish the relationship there. Um, the duplicate facet error was the next most common, and that saw data for the same facet for the same person uh, trigger multiple persons to be present in the automated process. So here we have a woman named Meg, and the automated process thought that it was two people together, a woman and Meg. So we've got duplicate information for the same facet. Both of them are, are telling us that a female is present, uh, but the automated process thought that it was two people. Other errors have to do with available inferences around age or gender uh, going on in the collection. Now, given the time frame and the cultural setting of this collection, uh, it could safely be assumed, for example, that married persons were uh, adult male-female combinations. So overall, these cases were um, predictable enough that they could be flagged for manual uh, review and future uses of the process, perhaps. So despite some uh, systematic errors, the automated process matched the manual process on the Williams collection with 95% accuracy for detecting persons and 85% accuracy for parsing facets. The facet parsing here was actually an improvement over the performance on the collection that the process was originally developed from. Uh, this is likely due to the fact that the Williams collection has simpler titles, uh, fewer identity characteristics going on, and uh, in general, just more literal language than uh, was used in the Becker Eisenman collection. So our findings here were promising. They do offer support for both the generalizability of the facet schema and the process itself uh, to other collections of carte de visite and other uh, historical collections of images of persons. Uh, that being said, there are certainly some important limitations as to just how generalizable this would all be to other collections. So the facet dictionaries themselves were developed and refined on two late 18th century American collections. Uh, because of that, they reflect uh, cultural assumptions at the time, uh, such as the gender of married persons or the gender of military members, uh, things like that. So the farther away in uh, time and place that you go from this setting um, and try to use the current dictionaries and process, the less successful the outcome would certainly be uh, without further modifications. Um, so, uh, again, adding additional subject metadata can enhance access to historical materials, uh, especially for uh, representations of persons and can answer calls to provide deeper access into aspects of personal identity. Uh, traditionally, doing so has been a relatively costly prospect for larger collections, um, but the automated case-based uh, method, as shown here, uh, may make this more feasible, uh, especially for images which typically have very little text associated with them, uh, to which other kinds of uh, text analysis methods are not really applicable. So uh, pairing this with manual review of any images that fall outside of the established cases could offer uh, perhaps the best combination of cost effectiveness uh, and accuracy going forward. Uh, and I should say, uh, just on a concluding note, that we are in discussion with a third institution uh, to try this for real with a real live set of metadata. So we are hoping to 
uh, get a chance to test and refine this further too. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Brian. This is great. I, you know, being a, a person with uh, knowing uh, how this project, uh, you know, coming to this point, um, it's great to see that you've made uh, significant progress uh, in branching out to other collections. Um, so it uh, uh, looks like we are ready for uh, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Julia Blood, uh, and she is an assistant professor at the UBC School of Information Study. Um, so her uh, research focuses on the design of knowledge organization systems. Uh, she uh, currently focuses on how catalogs can more uh, fully represent LGTB uh, to uh, QIA plus communities and how traditional cataloging represents indigenous topics. Um, she has a PhD from University of Texas uh, uh, at Austin and uh, Emma. LIS from University of British Columbia. Um, all right, without further uh, speaking in, go ahead, Julia. Thank you for the introduction and for your work moderating today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my slides. This was a short paper uh, in the DC um, proceedings, and so I will endeavor to give a short presentation and leave lots of time for questions. Um, this is work that was done on the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples, in what is currently known as Vancouver. And I'm presenting to you today from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, I can see that my two student co-authors on the paper are in the session today, so I hope that they'll be able to jump in later with answers to your questions too. So the work that uh, we did is, was completed in partnership with Out on the Shelves Library, uh, it's sometimes uh, shortened as OOTS. It's an independent volunteer run free library that serves the LGBT to QIA plus community in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, out, out on the Shelves is not part of the University of British Columbia, um, but right now it's using space provided by the student union. So it is conveniently a uh, very short walking distance from the School of Information. And it's quite common for uh, MIS students to uh, volunteer there uh, during their program and stay on as coordinators afterward. So this research project was designed in coordination with the Out in the Shelves coordinator team, and its outcomes have direct effects on the implementation of the library's online catalog. So some, for some background on uh, what this project was trying to accomplish, uh, in working with description and access metadata for Out in the Shelves, we're seeking to remedy or depart from traditional library practices that tend to embed homophobic and transphobic and otherwise discriminatory language into records and search systems. Uh, we were drawing from work uh, by Emily Drabinsky uh, a few years ago, who noted that in regards to the dominant library practices in the United States and also in Canada, that library users, quote, learn that heterosexuality is normative, that gay and lesbian sexual sexuality is the only sexual identity that ought to be examined, and that queer sexuality is inherently deviant. So for a queer-centered library, we obviously want to take a new approach. Uh, so we continue to find ourselves at odds with standardization approaches typical to library practice. The library workers who do descriptive and subject metadata are often duly constrained by standards and by tight timelines with high throughput expectations. User-centered approaches are relatively new in the library world, but they do exist. And so they might mean things like getting feedback on controlled vocabulary terms. And we, were, we drew from work that looks uh, at this. And so while user-centered design is important to out on the shelves, here we're specifically experimenting with creator-centered design. So thinking about the creators of the items that are in the catalog. Contacting the creators of items collected by the library is unfeasible uh, for all but name authority work, typically in library work, um, but we're trying something uh, experimental here. So this work was done uh, with the support of many colleagues. Uh, so we had a small research team, but like a much larger community that we were drawing from. 
So the volunteer team at Run the Shelves helped develop the approach and to implement changes to the processes and policies. And we had several librarians offer their time as consultants on the project and I named them uh, here. We also had input on the project's design from Violet Fox and Laura Kruger earlier on. And then we received financial support from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and from the UBC School of Information. Okay, so what we actually did, uh, we conducted a collection review of the library's holdings. It's about 3,500 uh, items. And we looked at sort of the uh, diversity and the representation uh, in terms of subject matter and also in terms of creators. And uh, after this review, we uh, bought additional items to fill in the gaps. Um, so we bought a number of books about asexuality, uh, intersex, non-binary, and polyamory identity and uh, lives. And then we sent recruitment emails to 32 uh, creators of items that we'd um, selected based on different identity categories. Uh, 12 of those creators replied, conceded, completed a consent process and an interview. The interviews uh, ranged a lot depending on the creators, um, what was relevant to their item and, and their sort of engagement with the topic, but they were about 30 minutes. And we gave all the participants the choice to be identified by their real names in our data and our publication and about half took this option and we can create pseudonyms for the rest. And then after the interviews, we created um, drafts of revised catalog records based on their input and collected further feedback on how they'd like that uh, revised record to be used. So as an example of uh, how we interviewed uh, folks, on the right hand side, I have um, what would be a default uh, subject and genre tag uh, subject list from a typical public library. Uh, so we shared how the book was presently represented at the time of the study uh, to the author, sending that in advance of the interview. Uh, and then during the interview, we focused on that um, excerpt as a topic of discussion. So participants would have questions about what this metadata does, how it affects retrieval, how it circulates among libraries through Capley cataloging. So in the interviews, Jerry would provide a lot of information to them as they needed to be able to contextualize uh, what the, uh, this list does. And then we would get general feedback on their subject and genre headings, uh, and then we would focus specifically on identity terms uh, from the creators. So we'd ask first which identities were represented in the book's content, focusing on audiences and characters. And then we would pitch to them the idea of adding terms about their own identities to the catalog. Uh, we discussed with participants their initial feelings on this approach and discussed how it could work. Uh, if they were amenable to the idea of having their identity represented in the list of headings, we asked how they would like their identity represented, so what terminology that they prefer would be used. Uh, after we got this input um, from all 12 creators, uh, we came together and made some revised uh, catalog records. Uh, these records now tend to have longer lists of subject, creator, and genre metadata um, for various reasons around uh, redundancy and um, getting into more uh, granular detail. The general findings from the study are informing the cataloging policy and outreach methods for the entire collection. So at the time that we're now presenting, there are many more items in the collection that are being described in this way, in addition to the uh, 12 folks who did the study. So in the paper itself, uh, we go through four main findings and four major design implications. And some of these will be familiar with folks who've done research in this area. Um, so uh, marked and unmarked identities was about uh, when creators were asked what kind of identity terms be relevant to them in the catalog. They tended to focus on queer identity terms uh, first and foremost. Um, if they brought up um, terms about like racial identity or disability, it was because those people had racialized identities or lived with disability. People wouldn't tend to say that they are, for example, cis or say that they were white. Uh, so if we followed creators input in that way, we would end up with the same kind of marked and unmarked identity uh, patterns that we would see in traditional uh, cataloging practice. Uh, we had uh, in-depth conversations with uh, quite a few of the participants about the term queer, uh, how it'd been used as a slur in the past, um, about whether it worked for them in the present, and how it could be useful as an umbrella term, in addition to using spe more specific identity terms like um, lesbian. Uh, they would talk about uh, changing terminology so um, that the correct term or the socially acceptable term that matched their identity had changed over their lifetime or had changed between uh, the generations before and after them. And then that their own identities had changed over time. So their sense of themselves 
um, and how they relate to the world had changed during their lifetimes or even during their publishing career. Uh, this led to several design implications. Um, so what rules that we're gonna have about prompting creators to uh, share more unmarked norm normative or privileged identities or whether we're okay with leaving this unmarked marked identity sort of asymmetry in the catalog. Um, we created queer as an identity term in the catalog uh, up until now, in terms of things like Library of Congress subject headings, queer is only available for things like, like queer theory. It's not attributed to people, it's attributed to conversations. Uh, so we did create this as uh, an identity term uh, in the control vocabulary that uh, OOTS uses locally. We also created some guidelines around uh, specific specificity, uh, recall, and redundancy. And so this is an ongoing conversation that will likely change as we uh, populate these rules across the catalog, but specifically thinking about um, rather than being as specific in our subject headings as the book is, um, actually being redundant in terms of using uh, umbrella terms and more specific terms on a single item to sort of boost uh, recall, especially when it um, comes to like overlapping um, and intersecting identities being retrievable. Uh, and finally, uh, we have design locations around the mutability of identity terms. One of the things we'd ask the creators was if the term that they had chosen for their own identity on the work later became, um, or later was deemed to be offensive or had fallen out of use uh, in the community, what they prefer uh, was done with that. Uh, but we also talked about whether or not the creator would change their own identity terms over time and how we should treat that. Different creators had different uh, preferences about how we handle that, sort of like, uh, anticipating forward. And so the uh, blanket design implication here was that we have to have ongoing input from the creator and that this isn't a one-time uh, process. Um, now I'm just going to focus on one way that these all uh, came together. Um, and this is in the works by approach. Uh, so we went through uh, different ways that we could indicate the creator's identity on the record, trying to think of different ways of expressing this. And um, uh, get different like phrase formations. Uh, so what we found overall is that participants expressed a need for an item by item approach and different participants had different reasons for this preference. So first several participants discussed the mutability of identity terms, um, self identity in terms of gender and sexuality can change over a person's life. This might be because of our understanding of ourselves changes or gets more accurate with more access to knowledge and community. Quite a few of our uh, participants talked about encountering uh, items in a library catalog that help them understand themselves and to put um, terms to their own identity. Uh, but it might also be because identity itself is mutable. So it's not just about accuracy, it's about the underlying, like the referent actually changing. So conversations um, that we uh, reviewed in queer theory signaled that this might be relevant for our collection and community, this idea of identity changing, and this did end up bearing out in the interviews. Participants also noted differing relevance of identity to items. So they would have, for example, multiple items already in our catalog or um, books that are about to come out. And then they talk about the decision that we'd made for the item that was the focus of the interview, uh, going having certain preference for that but it wouldn't be the same preference for other items so it might be that um, being a parent as an identity was very uh, applicable for one uh I'd work that was about adoption um, but being bisexual was more relevant for another work that they had in the catalog what this means is uh, like this mutability in this item by item approach is that uh, creator identity terms are put in the item record we're not putting uh, identity terms in a name authority record or otherwise linked through like a centralized thing. Um, even if we created a policy in which identity records were mutable and frequently updated, they are not equally relevant to all the terms the creator is attached to. Um, so some authors prefer different solutions to this phenomenon. Some wanted the identity they've lived at the time the item was created, published, collected, to stay associated with that item, regardless of whether their identity changed over time. Um, so even if they no longer use that term for themselves now or in the future, they might like that identity term associated with that item because they wrote it with that identity in mind and living that identity. Um, others would want um, sort of retroactive changes made as they changed um, their identity, um, not just for new works that came out, but back through our entire catalog. So for a policy, this means finding um, this uh, all means openness to ongoing input from creators. Obviously, we're focusing on living creators that were contactable um, here. 
Um, but it means that identity terms are not an all items approach or even a one time approach. Creators should have the ability to change their input into these records, um, even if they've um, had this uh, more like in depth uh, back and forth with us before. Uh, this also underscores the importance of giving informed choice and in how identity is marked in the catalog. So by item or across items. Most of the creators we talked to had never seen how their item was cataloged for libraries and definitely were not given input into the metadata. At most, they'd gotten a questionnaire from their publisher that was mostly fo focused on marketing and really didn't have much bearing and how um, their works were described in terms of subject or genre. Explaining to them what the choices were that were available, um, how these impact retrieval, how they change how items appear is just as important as creating the channel for feedback at all, making sure that they understand the choice that they're making. And so in conclusion, I'd just like to say a little bit about the context of this work. So folks thinking about um, how they might apply it elsewhere. Um, many of the participants noted that the changes they wanted for these records wouldn't be appropriate for catalogs and other libraries. So in understanding how cap copy cataloging work, they didn't want this record um, taken uh, entirely in, and shared with, for example, a public library. And um, in sort of in parallel to this research, uh, we moved the library catalog uh, from Koha to TinyCat and uh, Rio led that uh, process. Um, so uh, they've been training uh, out of the shelves volunteers on new processes mm -hmm. and um, how to record backend notes on creator informed records so that the record itself to the public view might not show that the creator had chosen those terms. But for the sake of managing the record over time, the um, folks who manage the catalog uh, do know when that happened and through what method. And in terms of ongoing work, we're looking at creating web tools for creators to initiate contact um, with OOTS for catalog changes. Um, so whether this be initiating a phone call or email exchange to give them more information or trying to embed all of those choices into a single form that gives them that informed choice. Uh, got a uh, quick look at our reference list here, but the full reference is available in the paper. Uh, we're quite grateful to the models of outreach work and queer metadata work we found uh, from colleagues. A lot of these with recommendations for uh, the librarians who are on the project. And this work is ongoing as it rolls up more changes to the catalog record, and we're working on other ways to express the broader relevance uh, to metadata practices more generally. So we'd absolutely welcome questions now and um, through the contact methods we've got listed on the slide. Uh, I'd like to note that my two student co-authors here did fantastic work with creators and in making uh, uh, implementing changes to the library practices, both in terms of the technology of the catalog and in documentation and training. Um, and since they are recent and soon to be grads, I highly recommend hiring them. Stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, Looks like we are ready to move to our last speaker. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Julia. And uh, our next speaker uh, is Tyne uh, Tyne Sumner. Uh, I had only the um, the bio information on the web for another author of this presentation. So would you please, uh, uh, you know, first introduce yourself uh, and then uh, follow by your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you for moderating. Um, just to check, you can see my first slide. But there. Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. So my name is Tyne Sumner. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in literary studies and digital humanities. And I'm presenting this paper on behalf of for three colleagues um, with whom we've done some work on the, the topic in front of you. And that is Professor Rachel Fincham, uh, Professor Joanna Mendelssohn and Dr. Nat Cutter. So our team, at least in the instance of this paper, work across literary studies, art history, uh, history and performance and dance studies. So none of us are data scientists, <laughs> which is a bit of a caveat to start with. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about our team in this paper. So I'm going to speak to some of the preliminary really findings from a new project based at the University of Melbourne. Uh, we have partners across Australia and partners in the UK, specifically King's Digital Lab. And what I will do in this paper is really just offer a small brief case study uh, from one particular cultural database that has raised for our project team some really interesting questions around name, 
um, gender, metadata and biography. And our team, in a sense too, has recently considered some of these challenges and questions alongside schemas such as Dublin Core and other um, bespoke ontologies that are active in some of the databases we're working with. So our project generally is called the Australian Cultural Data Engine. And this is an Australian Research Council funded project aimed mostly at improving the usability and interoperability of Australian cultural data. So our project, which is a two and a half year project, is interrogating the affordances of cultural data that up until the current moment has been used predominantly by subject matter experts, um, citizen scientists and enthusiasts in very specific ways. And we're looking to unlock that data and see across different kinds of collections to, to interrogate whether there are some connections that we can make. Um, our project slogan, if you will, is putting cultural data to work. And we've used the term engine to name our project because really we're a team that consists of subject matter experts, uh, data scientists, um, and project partners, interestingly, perhaps in the case of our project, who are intimately connected with the metadata schemas that um, upon which the collections are built and often are the only people that have the specific knowledge about some of the affordances and problems and challenges associated with that data. So in our project, a lot of work has involved um, the role of the interlocutor, like myself, moving between the question of the data scientist um, and the answer that might come from someone who has been um, involved in the collection of uh, particular kinds of cultural data and the construction of a database in its first instance. And so to give you an example, some of the collections we're working across and have access to really the back end of um, range from a collection called Circus Oz, which is a heritage collection um, of live performances of a circus troupe that performed in mostly Victoria, Australia from the 90s um, through to the present day. Uh, we're looking at the digital archive of Queensland architecture. So we're interested in questions of whether architecture um, can be made to relate to visual arts and other kinds of artistic fields. We're also looking at a big, um, an important collection called the Australian Live Performance Database, which is a collection um, extremely well maintained with a large user community that showcases live um, performance and theatre across Australia. The collection I'm going to talk about um, today is the Australian uh, Digital Art Align Collection, which is a collection of visual art about artists. And so really to give you a somewhat um, preliminary view of the ways in which we're thinking across these collections is that each contains um, in the first instance, a core field around which the collection has been based. So for example, the Digital Archive of Queensland Architecture is structured around what we're calling projects or at least in the collection called projects. So the clusters of data that spread out from um, that field might involve things such as relationships between architects or the biographical data of individual architects, but the collection in its um, first instance is structured around projects. Comparatively, for example, the, the Digital Archive of Australian Art, the DAO, is structured around a biographical schema which begins with the entries of artists. So what we're trying to do is connect up what in many cases are quite discrete um, and highly specific fields and consider whether we can read across those to conduct um, research around pressing topics such as the role of artists in contemporary life, the extent to which artists are funded, um, the relationship between the locations of uh, regional theatres and mental wellbeing, all kinds of questions that uh, are normally under the purview of more discursive qualitative uh, research, but could benefit from some of the quantitative data that's currently locked inside these collections. So looking across the various data, just to give you a background of where this paper comes from, uh, we've identified four themes, which 
we think speak to um, the interconnectedness of these databases. Um, we also think they speak to, as I mentioned, the complex and challenging task of looking at cultural heritage data from diverse sources and considering interoperability, particularly in a highly funding constrained um, context in which each database has received um, bursts or pockets of money over several years. And then due to the variations of government funding and institutional support has then gone without funding. So the kinds of data that we're, we're interrogating across the collections um, have enormous gaps at times and questions of interoperability and in analysing that data must therefore be attentive to um, the fact that just because we see a gap, say artists biographical entries in 2006, doesn't mean artists weren't working, it perhaps means that there wasn't funding available to enter in the data to the database. So these kinds of themes that we've identified, um, we also think are related to the rapidly changing nature of how cultural activity occurs, not just in Australia, but globally, uh, especially in a, a pandemic and post pandemic world where a lot of cultural activity, um, for example, is live streamed, might use VR or AR. So the reason I reference that is because in their originary context, the data that was um, being generated about performances or architecture and so on um, occurred in real time manually. Now in an interactive digital world, performances are being live streamed or viewed in much more diverse and complex ways, which databases um, in the cultural sector need to increasingly be attentive to. And so for example, in a recent Australian report, on the relationship between digital innovation and the arts. Um, this quote suggests that digital disruption has reorganized the cultural value chain, disrupting linear relationships between creation, production and distribution. And really what we're thinking about in our project is that this is <clears throat> happening out in the real world, but then needs to be reflected in the kinds of data that gets collected and entered into databases that have an ongoing relationship um, to the arts and cultural sphere. <clears throat> the other point that I would make is that entire ecosystems of engagement that exist in the digital world and in between corporate or critical modes of production um, have also been disrupted. So the point of this is really to say that as arts and cultural activity evolve, the data that we capture about this activity, <laughs> excuse me, about artists, um, the environment, global diplomacy, and so on, must increasingly um, reflect complex social relationships and political phenomena. <clears throat> so having set the scene for you um, a little bit here, <clears throat> and just quickly, these are three texts that um, speak to some of the questions I'm thinking about and our team is thinking about in this project around gender, um, biography and the interconnectedness of um, museums in the world today. <clears throat> now I'll move quickly to our um, database that is the focus of this paper and raises some of the key questions around names and metadata. There are other big collections in Australia that are pertinent to um, research on women's history. One of those is the Australian Live Performance Database, which I mentioned. Um, and also the National Library of Australia's Trove Portal. There's also the Australian Dictionary of Biography um, and a collection called the Australian Women's Register. So this particular database that you um, can see a snapshot of here is the Design and Art Australia Online. <laughs> and this provides a cross section of the visual arts in Australia and facilitates um, comparative insights around the naming of gender histories of women artists. This particular collection um, <clears throat> was established in 2007 as the Dictionary of Australian Artists Online. And it was the result of efforts um, to provide digital access point to the biographical works of two historians, Joan Kerr and Vivian Johnson. It was created by a consortium of universities um, and really it captures information about artists, designers, craft people, curators, and so on. 
In 2009, it was renamed the DAO, and it's now one of the most comprehensive uh, historical databases about artists, Australian artists' careers, containing over 17,000 biographical records. So examining the metadata of this uh, particular collection <coughs> reveals a range um, of information architecture problems and ontological challenges, especially around naming conventions. And I note, um, as I mentioned earlier, because this is a biographical uh, database that begins with artist entries and then expands outwards into other areas such as prizes, uh, recognition and so on. So in this particular metadata structure, we've identified that name variations, name changes and alternative names historically have been inconsistently applied in very complex but fascinating ways. And these inconsistencies have revealed the extent to which cultural databases must be responsive to evolving cultural understandings of the relationship, particularly between uh, name and gender. And this is in large part because contemporary research using cultural data, especially on questions of gender, increasingly depends upon access to these records. So to take just one example, um, here we have the many name variations entered into the DAO for the painter and cartoonist Constant Roth. This is an exemplary instance, as you can see, because this person has had many name variations. Roth was an English-born cartoonist, painter and journalist who worked in Melbourne, Tasmania and Sydney between 1881 and 1892. So as you can see, according to the Dow, Roth was known as H. Constance Roth, Constance Jones, Constance Penston, uh, CPARC, Madam Roth, uh, and many other wonderful possible names, including a nickname, the wonderfully pointed scalpel, with possible connections to other names in the very other, various other um, entries that have been entered in here. As Constance Jones, uh, Roth studied in London and Derby, ran a decorative arts firm and taught decorative art classes in Glasgow before moving and settling in Sydney, changing their name again in 1881. Um, Roth exhibited acclaimed watercolour, oil paintings and published illustrations and won prizes. Interestingly, just a little factoid for you for her Christmas cards. In 1892, she left Sydney um, with another partner and together moved to England and then South Africa, where even before her marriage, uh, her name changed again. From Johannesburg to then Cape Town, uh, she published a cartoon magazine called The Owl and attached to this publication, adopted new initials CP and sometimes ACP, Constance Penston. So this is a very um, sort of discursive way of essentially pointing out the disaggregated components of the name of a particular biographical entry and their frequency. So while Roth is the name that the artist was best known by in Australia, and the name Constance or the initial C appear widely, there's no single obvious name that persists through all or even the majority of her life's identifications. And I think what this little case study shows us is that researchers seeking to identify the same person across multiple data sources um, must navigate complex multiple name changes, pseudonyms, and changes to gender presentation and identification. And in particular with women, this takes the form of uh, taking the spouse's name at various points or marriages, uh, adopting double barrel surnames, or meddled marry names that draw on both a partner's um, and a birth name. The data set compiler, therefore, or archivist and digital curator must determine which names and which gender, gender identities might be primary um, and which might be alternative or secondary. And end users uh, subsequently encounter these divergent decisions and outcomes as they find the same person classified differently, potentially across multiple data sources. So even though this one example presents many problems, I think that the many entries um, of names in the DAO developed over almost four decades now are powerful resources to understanding 
the macro and micro forces that shape cultural production and individual relationships of artists, in this instance, in, in the field of art history. And they're also a remarkable example of the cataloguing of names that represent political, institutional and social patterns and conventions over time. And we found in our project that examining just this one collection um, and even one individual closely exposes the complex intricacies of um, naming variations and the way in which these have had an influence on shaping gender identities and in fact, artists' careers and lives over time. To a bit of a, a grander um, zoomed out view, we can also see in our project that recognizing the incomplete nature of many of the more than 17,000 biographical entries in just in this one database um, reveals the inconsistencies that arise when examining data of over 200 years ago. We extracted a subset of 2,188 biographies containing most certain key variables, uh, name, gender, year of birth, biography, artistic role, um, and career start date. And what we found just in this brief um, survey into some of this data was that of the total number of alternative names um, across all individuals, a, gender, a simple gender breakdown across um, the binaries of male and female, which isn't necessarily the correct way to do it for the, but for the purposes of pointing out the inadequacies in the data, um, revealed that, <clears throat> Of 841 people, 461 men had 1,139 um, alternative names, whereas of 373 women uh, had 900 alternative names. So leaving aside for the moment, the statistically insignificant unknowns, um, which had eight names between them, it would seem to suggest that men's names are more variable. However, dividing alternative names into distinct categories, um, precisely of the kind that I've just been articulating, begins to tell a rather different story. And so what this figure then shows um, is that women are substantially less likely to have alternative renderings listed, um, but are 31 times more likely to have a name change listed, which overall makes them more than twice as likely to appear under a name substantially different um, to their primary record. So that's a lot of statistics in one go, but to summarize that point, really what I'm saying is that the issue alone here means that women's names present, I think, a significantly greater challenge to tracing and identifying the presence of women in historical records. Um, and the notable category here of alternative names in the Dow presents that. So I'll just jump one little step ahead. The characterizations um, that our project has applied here, um, importantly, are based on renderings of extant data, comparing alternative names to primary and other alternative names, rather than devised through more traditional research into individual artist biographies. And one potential shortcoming of this approach is that it obscures um, when women use their initials instead of their full given names as a gender neutral pseudonym. Um, think here, for example, of P.D. James. Ascribing motivation to name changes presents another form of ambiguity uh, because this might not be made explicit in the textual metadata. Therefore, we've categorized all instances of using primary name initials as alternative renderings. So the statistical account um, that I'm outlining here substantially reflects the complexities of name changes and alternative names that have shaped women's histories at the qualitative and aggregate levels um, I've discussed just before. As databases uh, progress and data structures such as Dublin Core engage in restructuring these name entities, perhaps the question of how names um, are entered into databases in the first instance will need to progress a range of alternative mechanisms for tracking change over time. There's also a movable hierarchy of names, at least we've observed with this collection, which means that it's possible to privilege an artist's new name, perhaps, while not denying past achievements under a previous name and or gender identification. 
For example, the artist now known as D. Harding or Dale Harding has entered an alternative name and their gender is now in the record unspecified. This metadata classification perhaps operates in a somewhat different manner, uh, for example, to the data about Net in Netflix's streaming original um, series Umbrella Academy, in which Ellen Page has now been retrospectively changed to Elliot Page in all three seasons of the Caesars series online record. So as these very um, various examples show data categories that may seem objective or merely bureaucratic to the average person, particularly when it comes to name and gender, are often highly subjectivized and produced under conditions of bias and or social preservation. Moreover, as Lauren E. Bridges explains, uh, quote, entropic, fugitive or queer data histories of categorization and naming have long been entangled in histories of sovereignty, colonialism, subjectification, uh, subjugation and exploitation. And reflecting this reality, Boker and Starr rightly argue that we have a moral and ethical agenda in our querying of these systems. Each standard and each category valorizes some point of view and silences another. This is not inherently a bad thing. Indeed, it is inescapable but it is an ethical choice and as such is dangerous, not bad, but dangerous. So to conclude, <clears throat> querying and updating the classification systems for gender and name in cultural databases, as we're in many instances attempting to do through some of our investigations, requires a synthesis of uh, social and intellectual accountability, reflecting culturally and socially informed work with technical expertise, not just one or the other. When it comes to da name data in cultural databases, it is therefore uh, very encouraging that metadata standards and taxonomies are slowly evolving to reflect the fluidity of gender and the need for more diverse understandings of gender. And one example of these, just in the Australian context, um, is the government standard for sex, gender, variations of sex characteristics and sexual orientation variables uh, developed by the Australian Bureau of Statistics to standardize the collection and dissemination of this kind of data. And so in closing, we can see that a name in a cultural database um, thus becomes a representative, if not the exemplary instance of the interplay between one's personal perception of themselves and their public persona in a much broader um, and diverse arts and cultural sphere. So while naming can be performative in practice, it can also be revealed as a sign of power in the process of datafication. Um, and I will leave that there. Thank you. Oh, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, thank you for a great presentation. And uh, uh, I think um, all three papers talks about, talk about uh, uh, the identities and then, and I think from different angles. So um, I think we, uh, our uh, session has gone, uh, well, and we are um, we are having about two minutes left. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, well, um, and I would like to take this moment to thank all our uh, uh, paper presenters and for a uh, you know great session. And uh, I think we. Um, you know, our session is done and hope uh, we'll see you uh, later uh, in the, you know, after the break, we'll see you uh, in other sessions. Thank you all for attending and we are finished. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you.